know, things happen and we are just so happy and thankful that you're able to join us tonight. Um, for, to get us started, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started writing? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I, Start from the very beginning when you were just a little tiny egg. Well, like everybody else, you know, or, or like a surprising number of people, I uh, was lent a copy of The Wolf and the Dove or The Flame and the Flower, one of those um, sort of foundation romance novels um, that we probably wouldn't be as interested in today as we were back in junior high when there was still junior high. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, you know, the, the idea that a, a book is built around a relationship, um, that it, there's a happily ever after, compared to what I was being forced to read in school, which was essentially Lord of the Flies and Catcher in the Rye. Mm -hmm. Like, that stuff is tripe. I'm reading this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I became a voracious reader and uh, I also became a single mom. I also became a lawyer. And I was sitting in a law office one night. You know, court deadlines are serious. If you miss your deadline, your client will be very unhappy and there's no do over. And I'd gotten so tired. I was at the point where something that I should have knocked out in 20 minutes was taking forever. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm just going to treat myself here. We're going to do a little recess, a little change of pace. I always had a book with me. I'm going to read one chapter. And, uh, you know, this is going to be my treat and, and perk me up. And then I'd be done in 45 minutes with whatever I was working on that I had to file the next day. Well, the book I had with me was from an author that I could rely on to write a great book, but she just was having an off chapter or something. Hmm. This pernicious thought, which I hope runs through the minds of half the people watching, I bet I could write one of those. Yeah, uh, popped up and I'd say, oh, and for the next 45 minutes, I did not write my motion to, you know, whatever. I just I wrote essentially the first chapter of Gareth um, in sort of embryonic form. I couldn't recall when I'd had so much fun. Oh, that's so um, cool. Yeah. So I just started, you know, I, I uh, for a time I was married to a distance runner. And this guy would talk about, you know, hitting like the five mile mark and everything would click in and he would be one with the universe and just go for another 15 miles. And I would think, buddy, you're nuts. Um, he would talk about being in the zone. I had no idea, you know, what he was referring to because exercise is a form of torture. But... Uh -huh. Yes. When I started writing, I got it. I, I understood, oh, he meant this place where you lose track of time and you lose track of identity. You forget, you know, I'm Grace working on my legal stuff. You're just blissing um, on the task. So, you know, when you have that much fun, you tend to persevere. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. Uh, until my six siblings made it a habit every time they saw me to ask, when are you going to get that stuff published? You know, like you just kind of go out to the backyard and pick a contract off the apple tree. Um, but No one's going to call you out like your family. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and they're a pretty articulate bunch. What occurred to me, though, was the kind of law I practiced was child welfare law. Um, and this is a polite way to refer to child abuse and neglect. Mm. Um, and it occurred to me that perhaps I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. And it would be nice to have um, a back door to my borough, uh, another sort of arrow in my quiver. And if the writing turned into something professional, that would be lovely. But if it didn't, I enjoyed doing it. So it's win-win. Uh, but eventually I did land a contract and um, I've been writing ever since. I am no longer lawyering though. <laughs> That's, <laughs> that is just, you know, the, the worst day being a published author is still better than most days <laughs> being a child welfare attorney. So yeah, I'm very grateful to be published and very grateful to be an author. 
what was it like when you got to make that transition from, because I mean, I'm sure you had to balance that world of being a lawyer and being a writer at the same time. What what was it like when you finally got to put away that one chapter of your life and really focus on being a full-time writer? Um, a tremendous relief. Uh, you know, the, the legal stuff is serious. You talk about dark. Yeah. Um, and I had been doing it for so long. I've been doing it for 25 years. And at that point, you don't even realize how much stuff you're carrying around. But I will also say that I had thick skin as a lawyer. Um, you know, I had to watch my clients go home to dangerous situations or they had to stay in foster care when I knew another six months in foster care was just going to, they're going to blow a gasket. Um, it, it was tough. And other attorneys are not always the nicest people to deal with. And the judges had bad days. But it required a whole other kind of thick skin to be an author. Mm -hmm. you know, there are people out there that just think your book is the worst thing ever written, and they're very articulate about it. Um, you know, there are other people that resent your success, and other people that, um, you know, you uh, you don't know what you've done wrong, but clearly you've offended them, and they're very vocal about it. And I just I wasn't prepared for. Um, the fact that when you are an author, comparison data, how you're doing compared to everybody else is mm -hmm. all over the place. You know, as a lawyer, my client would know if I won or lost and the other people in the courtroom. But my, my rank, so to speak, wasn't on Amazon for everybody to look at. Everybody yeah. in the whole world. Wow, um, good point. All the other authors and all my readers know how my releases go. And this is fine. It's the nature of the industry. But for me to make the transition was sort of like, wait a minute, I thought this was, it was supposed to be like happily ever after. Then it's no, there's an element of happily ever after, but the industry also has its challenges. Absolutely. And you know, the, the best part is always the writing of it and not the business part of it behind the scenes, you know? Oh, I agree. I mean, you know, people say, what do you like? And you're supposed to say, oh, I love it all. I do love the writing and I love the interaction with the readers. Hi, guys. Um, but the meeting with the tax accountant, it's not so fun. <laughs> no. It's just not. <laughs> Well, you mentioned earlier that you have you were always a big reader. Um, what was your, was there somebody in your life that introduced you to reading or did you kind of just find it yourself? I uh, found it myself sort of in through the back door. Um, my dad was a college professor, but his thing was science. I don't think I've ever seen him read a work of fiction. <laughs> of course not. Uh, and uh, my mother was quite a reader, but my thing was about the age of 10, I started playing the piano. I started taking piano lessons and I figured out this is one of those gigs where the harder you work, the better you get. You know, the piano is pretty fair. The keys are all in the same place every time you sit down and the music always means the same thing. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty fair challenge in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I was not particularly social as a kid. And my mother got the bright idea uh, one summer. She was going to drop me off at the library. And the librarian was the one who asked, well, what are you interested in? And, you know, of course, at that point, I am about, you know, how people are when they're young. Don't um, talk to me. <laughs> yes. And I'm staring at my saddle shoes and I can't mm -hmm. put words together. But um, I said, I like music. And she said, well, would you like to read some biographies of composers? And uh, I spent that summer just nauseous. I binged before it was popular. Right. Every shelf they had that had to do with biographies of composers. And composers tended to be pretty colorful people. Um, and, you know, they had them 300 years ago and they had them uh, in this century. And uh, some of them were even women and people of color. And this, I ended up getting a degree in music history, but that summer where I always had a book, like great big biography of Arturo Rubinstein, or mm -hmm. um, it was, um, 
in adolescence, we need places where we feel competent. I mean, we, we do all throughout life, but especially um, in our transition periods. And it was just like, I've got books in one hand and the piano in the other. I'm going to be okay. And I also had a horse. So you know, those were the, the sort of the three legs of my stool. Mm -hmm. And they continue to be in some regards. I love that. Do you still have horses now? So I'm today. Yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. That's so cool. Uh, well, um, what is, what do you love most about crafting historical romance? What do I love most? Mm -hmm. uh, probably, well, <sighs> where to start? Um, I think historical romance has one of the savviest readerships uh, because a lot of the historical romance readers have been reading for decades. You know, they've known this genre since it, it started. Um, and uh, I, I like savvy readers. I like they know what they want um, and they go for it and they stick with it. And uh, they tend to be interesting people so the readership is terrific and you you probably know that i'm preaching to the converted um but the time period the regency time period is so hauntingly like our own uh in the sense that uh there is terrible suppression of civil rights uh there was tremendous wealth inequality and it was getting worse corrupt government, aspirations toward better government, uh, gender roles were being redefined, a whole lot of international relationships were being redefined, technology was sort of slamming everybody in a tsunami um, of change. So uh, people were on about prison reform and corruption in the police force. It's like, wait a minute, where have I heard this before? Mm -hmm. um, and to feel the humanity coming through across the centuries of, um, you know, folks being outraged because their son was arrested at a demonstration um, simply for protesting the stinking corn laws, um, which, you know, it was, they were purely enacted for the sake of enriching a small class of people at the expense of the lives of others. And, you know, I can get all excited about that. Clearly, you can tell, just like I can get excited about politics today. So it is the that uh, sense of the more things change, the more they stay the same, or those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Um, it's just, you know, the, they're my people, those, yeah. those Regency people, they're my people. I love that. And kind of as a follow up, how do you how do you kind of view the past and how does it inform the present to you? I I love reading biographies um, because the humanity of the individuals that we read about. You know, we all see that portrait of uh, the Duke of Wellington where he's so, mm -hmm. and he's hot too. <laughs> But when you, you read, you know, that the love of his life was denied him because uh, he was an impecunious younger son and then he had to go to India and get rich and he came back 12 years later and they didn't know each other, but he was still determined to prove that he's good enough for her. And then they had a distant, miserable marriage. And it's like, wow, we're all just people. Mm -hmm. um, and... You know, that doesn't seem to be changing across millennia or centuries. And uh, it, it's, it just gives you a sense of being a member of the species. Absolutely. So I know that you've got um, a big, exciting Christmas release coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about what we can expect this upcoming December? A Christmas release. Um, actually, my Christmas release uh, is this year is a duet with Christy Caldwell, mm -hmm. just a couple of novellas, but for us, it's an experiment. Um, oh, really? Yeah, we're releasing exclusively to libraries. Cool. Speaking yeah. of your love of libraries, the place where yeah. you were introduced to reading. 
Well, our love of libraries and also when, when we were planning this in the spring, we didn't realize that libraries would become a topic floating in and out of the news. Mm -hmm. um, book banning and, uh, you know, Nora funding a library when the town fathers wanted to jerk the funding. And um, I feel pretty strongly that libraries are a good thing. Yeah. And um, that the retail model should be for selling things and the subscription model should be for libraries because they bring so much to the community. Where I live, the library is the only cold weather day shelter. Mm -hmm. It is a matter of life and death to have a library open on some winter days. And, you know, that's not what libraries are supposed to do, but the library steps up as a member of the community. Um, you know, if you need a place for your knitting club to meet, you can go to the library. If you just want to get out of the heat during the summer, you can go to the library. And it's, uh, you know, we have a good county library with a lot of branches and a beautiful downtown main library. And in a, where I live, this county has had 20% adult illiteracy since I got here 35 years ago. And I am two hours from Washington, D.C. There is no excuse for this. Mm -hmm. And where do you go if you want adult literacy classes? You go to the library. And again, that shouldn't be their remit, but they have picked up the slack. So, you know, I feel very strongly that libraries deserve our support. And so Christy and I got together, wrote a couple of novellas, um, and we're releasing only two libraries. And if you can't get to a library, you can get the ebook from my website. But the idea is dust off that library card and take a look at your library website and get to know what your library has to offer. Because if you want this title, you're going to find it at the library. I love that. Do readers need to do anything? Like if they want to request the books, the, the novellas at their library, do they need to help sort of encourage and spread the word? Uh, well, oh, by the way, the title is Yuletide Gems. Oh, um, adorable. And, well, and the idea is next Christmas, we'll put it on sale if there's demand for it, and we will write Yuletide wishes, you know, about, or Yuletide gifts about bookstores or mm -hmm. about something else we're passionate about. Um, but again, it should be a library only release the first year. Uh, and I, I don't expect that this title will be as financially successful as the other stuff that Christy and I put out for retail sale. So what? You know, uh, my cats are fed and um, <laughs> my 12-year-old Prius is paid off. So uh, I think it is, it is more important to give a little bit back to the libraries that have been so wonderful to so many authors, especially me. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I do very well with the library demographic. And um, when I release a book, if it's an, an indie published book that I did myself, libraries, specifically overdrive libraries, are my second largest revenue stream in the release month. Fantastic. So, yeah, I'm, I want to be big friends with all the librarians because they've certainly been very good to me. That's so cool. So with the novellas, did you, are you sharing a story or are they two separate stories? Both stories, they are two separate stories, but they both, uh, each one has a library that figures prominently okay. in it. And a librarian is one of the protagonists. And Christie's, um, which is the, the title of hers is Diamond in the Rough, the librarian is a guy. And he is up from the gutter and he feels passionately about books because that's how he climbed out of the gutter and out of a life of crime. And he is not who you expect, you know, to come around the um, circulation desk and help you find your next book on manners. But uh, we had fun with the project and I, I hope readers had fun with it too. Oh my gosh, that sounds fantastic. And I know this room is full of, of library lovers. So we are thrilled to see more library love. <laughs> Well, I hope it catches on. I hope other authors will do library first releases because I also, um, I turn my titles loose in the library sooner because mm -hmm. I know that reserve queue is a thing um, and people wait weeks uh, on, on the reserve waiting list. And um, so we're going to turn our Christmas title loose um, at the end of September. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're eighth on the list, you might not get it until November anyway. 
That's true. <laughs> well, and for you and Christy, what was the reasoning for you wanting to do library first? Uh, because we both feel pretty strongly that uh, libraries deserve our support, but also as authors, you're always looking for what haven't I tried? Is there yeah. a leadership that I could speak to a little more effectively? Um, uh, is there a demographic that I haven't thought about? And, you know, the, the library demographic, voracious readers, um, and they are the biggest library demographic is women between 59 and 74. Mm -hmm. Those are my people. <laughs> you know, that is also a big historical romance demographic and just a big reading demographic. So uh, why wouldn't you make an overture in their direction? You know, so many authors are concerned about, I got to get my stuff in Walmart. Uh, Walmart's a great place to find everything that you forgot. Um, but <laughs> in terms of a place to buy books, the only reason Walmart has books in the store from what I understand talking to the sales reps is they put them in the back of the store so that you will have to walk past a whole bunch of other merchandise um, and, you know, find something, you know, you'll pick up a Grace Burroughs this month, but they may not have another Grace Burroughs title for two years. Right. They buy what's cheap. Um, and, you know, so if the readers that I'm going to find in Walmart might be fine and lovely people, but they're probably not core Grace Burroughs fans. They just want to read something until their husband gets done in automotive. Uh -huh. uh, and, uh, you know, I, the other thing is, to be quite honest, um, the author doesn't make much on those sales. There's heavy discounting required. Um, and that means the publisher is not making much. So, you know, if, if readers want to support the publishing industry and keep good books coming, that's not the place to buy your books. Ooh, I just limited my career. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if we disagree with you on this. I think we totally agree, actually. <laughs> I do, at least. It's very true. Um, all right. So we have, we're now going to enter into our fresh facts portion. We're just going to throw out some fun little questions at you, answer however you feel. Um, okay. So our my first one is, what is your favorite time of day to write? First thing in the morning when all the alpha waves are still sort of trailing through my brain. I love it. What's your favorite time of day to read? All the time. <laughs> I mean, I keep a book in my purse and a book in the smallest room in the house and a book by the bed and, a, you know, there are books in the car. It's just. How many uh, books at one time are you reading, Grace? Usually three or four. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most people will reach for the cell phone. I reach for a book. You know, I, I try to use my phone as a phone. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm. If you text me, I will probably get back to you, but I'm not likely to initiate a text. I will call you, but um, books all the time, 24 okay. seven. That's so funny. Physical books still, or do you do ebook? Both. Both. Um, okay. It depends. The studies are that we, we read differently, ebook and print. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's something that's pretty meaty, I'll get it in print. Um, yeah. if it's a biography, if it's a, a, a period resource, but if it's fiction, then I probably use my nook. That's cool. I love that. Um, who was your first book boyfriend or girlfriend? Ah, uh, hmm, 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 hmm. Gosh, I don't know. My current book boyfriend is Captain Lacey. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Captain Lacey. Well, uh, this is Ashley Gardner, Jennifer Ashley's Regency sleuth. Um, and, uh, you know, of course he's been through the wars and he has a limp and he falls for a lady. Um, and, uh, she has, I think September 20th is when the next book in the series is coming out. And she said it in Rome. Um, and there was an awful lot of, you know, traveling back and forth between London and Rome. Um, so there's Captain Lacey, but I'm trying to, who predated him? Hmm. Uh, the list is endless, <laughs> but he's my current book boyfriend. I love that. How do you celebrate a new release? Uh, by forgetting my purse at the vet's office, by driving past my exit, by forgetting who I called while I'm waiting for them to pick up. Um, I will sometimes lose track of the fact that because you set everything up long in advance of a release mm -hmm. day and you're working on 
three other books by then. And then if I have one of these days, the first thing that occurs to me is, oh, it's Tuesday. And the next thing that occurs to me is I have a book coming out today. <laughs> you know, my subconscious knows there's big stuff going on to the point where I can't focus on things and I, the words won't come that morning. But the conscious awareness that this is a release day is often, uh, you know, not as front and center as you think it should be. Uh, with traditional books, the books I've written for source books and Hachette, there is much more of a focus on the release day. But um, for independently published books, you know, I'm I am on down the road in the production chain with other books. And I just sometimes have to walk into the wall to remember, oh, yes, this is my release day. That is so funny. Um, OK, so what is one luxury item that you cannot live without? Potable water. Um, I live in the country mm -hmm. and I drink well water. So, you know, the quality of the water is a serious issue. And the fact that there is water. Um, so, but in terms of, you know, putting on my author hat, um, I start the day with a cup of jasmine green tea. And mm -hmm. in that jasmine green tea, there is heavy cream oh. and there is manuka honey. Hi, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I want the first thing in the day. And I am privileged to have it. And thus, civilization is allowed to roll forward. <laughs> it's the only caffeine I have, and it's, I just, it's my thing, my little jasmine green tea with manuka honey, and, and then I feel so special, and so sort of fortified against all perils, I sit down and write. I love it, I love it. All right, well, you teased a little bit that you're currently reading three books right now. Tell us a little bit about the books that you're reading. Do you have any recommendations? We love hearing uh, your recommendations from authors. Um, I am reading a biography of Nikola Tesla, who is the guy essentially who invented usable electricity, despite what Edison would want you to think. He invented mm -hmm. radio, um, a Serbian uh, immigrant. And he was active sort of during, at the turn of the century, the 1880s through about the 1930s. Um, it's fascinating stuff because, of course, my dad was a scientist and uh, there, there was a world war in there. Anyhow, good stuff, a biography. I am reading Charles A. Foster's book, Being a Human. Charles Foster is both a veterinarian and an attorney. And he looks at sort of environmental issues and sociological issues from a very strange perspective. Um, you know, he'll if you don't, don't start with being a human, read being a beast, where he tries to literally get into the skin of a badger by living in a hole in the side of the creek bed, or, you know, just strange things, but he's a phenomenal writer. Uh, his turn of phrase is so elegant and so unexpected. Um, I cannot recommend him highly enough if you want a different thought provoking read. Charles A. Foster, Being a Beast or uh, Being a Human. There are two books. Being a Human is the new release. Um, then I am also reading a book on creativity, which I'd have to go to the bathroom and get to get to find you the title. Um, it's written by a couple of graphic designers who um, were brought up in the school of thought that you're a creative person or you're not. Um, and it's just too bad about you if you're not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they felt that was uh, a challengeable assumption. And um, so they, they did the research, they uh, collected the studies, and they've published this book about how they teach creativity to design students. Um, and of course, I'm interested in this. I've written something like 100 books all those bright ideas I had, you know, back when I was procrastinating my legal work by writing romances, those I've used up. I published those 10 years ago. I published them 80 books ago, you know, and then I've twisted the tropes and I've inverted the assumptions. And I'm, I am at the point where a brand new, fresh idea is a precious and special thing. They don't happen that often. Um, so I read a lot about creativity and this is my current creativity book. 
Awesome. Well, Grace, um, we don't like to keep our author too long, so I'm going to turn this over to our readers to ask you some follow-up questions. Thank you so much for your time, but before I turn this over to the readers, can you tell us where they can uh, find out more about you and stay in touch with you online? Thank you for that. Um, of course, I have a website, graceburrows.com. It's got all the latest and greatest. It has the ordering links, a bio. You can get in touch with me there with the contact, Grace. I blog. I am still blogging every Sunday. Um, and uh, my blog commenters are the most interesting, thoughtful people. We have a good time on that blog. Love it. Um, so see y'all on the blog. The well, Grace, thank you so much for staying to, to take a few more questions from our readers.